Well, hello, and welcome to this episode of The Terry Cole Show that I want to start with a question. When you experience something that is distressing, you have a rough interaction with someone else, a rough interaction with someone on the street, you get bad news, and afterwards, you want to self-soothe. Do you have a couple of drinks? Do you smoke a little weed? Do you eat a tub of ice cream? Think about it, because that's actually confusing self-soothing with self-numbing. And in today's video, I'm going to be making the distinction between those two things. I'm going to share what a self-soothing and stress relief toolkit is. And in the downloadable guide, I'm giving you instructions on how to make your very own. And I'm giving you my top personal self-soothing go-to action. So before we get started, if you are new to my channel, I want to make sure that you subscribe and that you hit the bell because I roll out new stuff every Tuesday and interviews on Thursdays, and I do not want you to miss a thing. If you don't know me, my name is Terry Cole. I'm a licensed psychotherapist, a relationship expert, and the author of Boundary Boss, which you can get at boundarybossbook.com. And I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for all of your questions and all of your comments and all of your interactions. You know I read every single one, and I love to highlight your comments. So I'm shouting out to Tanya in the um, for the video, Beyond Exhausted, Strategic Incompetence Might Be to Blame. Tanya wrote, my husband and I enjoyed listening to you during our morning coffee. You are so good and have become part of our daily lives. Appreciate your tremendous knowledge. Why, thank you, Tanya. I'm so excited that I'm a part of your morning coffee clutch. That is awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Now, on to today's content. Self-soothing. What is it? It is a way that we regulate, right? It's strategies we use to regulate our emotions when they've been disrupted. It's a way that we work to regain. Uh, we could call it homeostasis. We could call it equilibrium. We could call it getting back to our center. Because when we have distressing experiences, it really gets us out of being in our center, right? We are activated. Some people might say triggered. And that is we're, we're in a high stress situation. That means anxiety is high. You might be having a physical response to that. But think about the way that you respond when someone else is in need, when you need to soothe someone else. You probably have lots of ideas. And probably you're not giving them a tub of ice cream. You might be soothing them. You might be putting a hand on someone's back. You might be stroking someone's hair, especially if it's a child. And I think most of us are really pretty good at attempting or working to soothe others in our life who we love. But I think that we can be kind of not great at doing it for ourselves because I think there's a lot of confusion around it because um, it's hard to ask for help. Sometimes it's hard to put into words what we're feeling and what we need. So, you know, I, I realized the power of self-soothing and our senses um, when I became a therapist decades ago, 25 years ago, actually. And I would have my clients come in, they would lay down on the couch and inevitably at some point during the session, the beginning or the end, I would do an on the spot guided meditation that was associated with the content of what we were talking about in their sessions. But my room itself, no matter where I am, my room itself always had candles that smelled beautiful. I always gave them lavender or bergamot or other essential oils that um, were known to be very calming. And I made sure that it was quiet I had only twinkly lights on like I have behind me because I do have them in all of my, every, everywhere in my house every, when I travel. So I created this atmosphere. And what I realized is that if they would now carry lavender, let's just say that was the scent that they chose when they were in my office, then I asked them to carry it with them. And when they were in a distressing situation, to put some on their hands, and just take a couple of deep breaths, maybe 20 seconds of breathing. And what I found over and over is that your body remembers. 
and were very Pavlovian, you know, Pavlov's dogs, where there was a whole study that was done where when it was time to eat, they'd ring a bell and the dogs would come and eat. And then they stopped bringing the food, but when they rang the bell, the dogs would salivate as if food was coming because they were so conditioned to eat when the bell rang. So this is a very similar thing where my clients are able to tap back into the physical calm that they experience in my office simply by smelling the smell of lavender or bergamot or whatever their smell of choice is. So I was like, wow, that is really astounding, watching it in real life happening over and over again. And then I realized, oh, there is a way to help clients create their own sort of self-relief, self-soothing kit so that it's something that is ready when they find themselves in that situation, which I'll get to after. But this is something because when you think about how our memories work and what are the strongest things in our five senses that bring back experiences, your olfactory, your smell sense is one of the most poignant. It's one of the most profound. It's one of the most, like it can bring you back anywhere really quickly, which is also why, you know, it, this also works in reverse in a negative way. When you think about post-traumatic stress syndrome that people experience, if you had a terrible car accident and in that car accident, there was a particular smell. My husband and I actually had a really scary car accident about three years ago. Actually, we were going to Gabby Bernstein's house to see uh, she and her husband. They were, we were going to be painting landscapes. My husband had all the paints in the car because he's an artist. Anyway, we ended up having a head-on collision on our way to Gabby's and Zach's, and we never made it that day. And we were both okay, thank God, minor injuries. But it was a very um, traumatizing experience because it was so scary. I thought for sure we were going to die, literally, because there was no time. The person was making a mistake and moving right in front of us, and we were doing probably 40 or 50 miles an hour, and we slammed into them at that speed. It was terrifying. Anyway, the I'd never had an experience where the airbags came out, and they have this powder that has a particular smell. And in fact, my husband and I both thought it was smoke. We thought the car was on fire, trying to get ourselves out of our seats. It was very scary. But that smell itself and the smoky smell of like um, metal on metal and, you know, um, wheels, the rubber grabbing the road we were trying to stop. Anytime, even now, and this is years later and I've done trauma work on that experience, anytime I smell any of those things, I will be flashed back to the moment right before impact in that accident. Now, to me, that's a normal stress reaction. It's a normal response because it doesn't last long. It's I'm not having intrusive memories or dreaming about it. But again, that smell sense is so um, strong that it brings me right back there. So what we're talking about here is doing that in a positive way is using things that create a sense of calm for you with all of your senses. I just happen to be talking about smell, but when you get the instructions in the downloadable guide, you'll see that you're going to do all of your five senses in the little kit that you can create because there's lots of things that soothe us, but only we know what those things are. So you're going to create one of those. I want to hear, I'm dying to hear what it is that you Th think about it and if it works for you. But let's move on to other ideas, other things that you can do. If you're in a stressful situation, you just had something dramatic or traumatic happen and you feel sort of frozen, moving, right? Just going into another room or getting outside, if you can, even if it's just for five minutes to walk around the block, this tends to be soothing. There's something about if you can go out in nature, even for a brief period of time, it can be incredibly helpful. Another thing that is helpful is actually moving your body or doing energy work, which is what I do. That's one of my faves is my friend, Lara Riggio. Many of you know, she's an energy medicine expert. She's someone I work with all the time with clients and someone who contributes to all of my um, courses because her work is so complimentary 
to mental wellness work. Because sometimes, as my friend Chris Carr would say, we got issues in our tissues. So we got to move the energy. So doing a really quick, which I'll include in your downloadable guide, one of my faves from Lara for free, just for you guys to have, because I keep it on my phone and I use it whenever I'm in any kind of a situation where I need it. And on any of these things, take no time. And many of them are things that you can do in a meeting. Like it, they don't have to be things that it's obvious that you're doing. It's you're holding points on your body that tell your body to relax. And I find it to be incredibly helpful. Another thing that is one of my go-to self-soothing um, instruments, but has been since I was a child, is taking a warm bath. Now, not everyone likes to take baths and not everyone has bathtubs, but if you do, and it could be a warm shower if you prefer showering, but I love the, there's something very transportive for me about taking a bath that I put bath salts in, I light candles, I turn the lights down. You know, again, it's I'm engaging in a soothing way all of my senses when I'm taking that bath. It's not just a bath you're taking to get clean because I'm usually already clean by the time I take that bath. It's really more for my state of mind and to get me back to a centered place if my centeredness, if my equilibrium has been disrupted by an experience, by a phone call, by a meeting, by anything. Because there are so many things that can create disequilibrium in our bodies. Um, another thing that is really helpful, one of my faves, is guided meditations. There is something incredibly soothing about I listened to my friend and my meditation teacher 20 years ago, David G is his name. He's got the most beautiful voice. Listen, I have tons of guided meditations, but for me, listening to my own guided meditations is freaking weird. So I do not do that, but I love David G's meditations. He's got such a beautiful, soothing voice. So I'll do an eight minute meditation. I'll just take a break in my day and always for me, that will help me become more centered because it soothes my frayed nerves. That's really what we're doing. We are looking to soothe our nervous system because that is what got activated with what we were doing. Another thing that I wanna to talk to you about is if you're in a relationship or friendships or whatever, a relationship in particular, you need to make sure that you know what is soothing to your partner and that your partner knows what is soothing to you. The same way that we look at love languages because we're all so different. I know you guys are familiar with the five love languages, which means how do we feel loved in life? Some people it's gifts. Some people it's acts of service. Some people it's physical touch. Some people it's um, quality time, right? There are five different love languages. That doesn't mean that your love language is immediately, you know, actions that would fulfill the love language would be soothing, but it's a good bet that they're going to be in the same general area. Um, physical touch is one of my love languages that I need, that I feel loved by affection. And that is absolutely soothing to me when I'm upset. So there's something that you can do within your relationship. You can have the conversation. And if your partner is upset or feeling dysregulated and you want to soothe them, you can say, how can I, right? Like what would be soothing for me to do for you right now. But I'd like to have the conversation. I would like you to have the conversation prior to either one of you being in that kind of a mini crisis because it's hard at that moment to even think about what would be soothing. So I always want to have those conversations when I'm not already in some kind of a dramatic situation. And just, you can um, just explore what is soothing. I know that with Vic, it's just being with him. If he's upset or dysregulated about something, I'll say, hey, 
Do you want to just bat this? Let's take, take a ride. Let's just go on an adventure and we can talk about this in the truck. And that always seems to help. That wouldn't help other people, especially if you don't live in the country and you don't have a truck and you don't have someone to go with. So it's really very unique and specific to you and your partner, but it's so important. And before you can even tell someone else what is soothing to you, you need to understand what is soothing to you. Because again, it's easy for us to look at self-numbing behaviors and mistake those as soothing. But how you can tell the difference is with self-numbing behaviors, usually there will be some negative consequence down the road for that behavior. So if you are using alcohol to self-numb and you think it's self-soothing, you will be hungover the next day, let's say, or maybe drunk text your boss that night and ball them out or do something that will then create a negative ripple effect in your life. And the same thing with eating a tub of ice cream. There's nothing wrong with eating ice cream, right? But if it makes you feel gross the next day, or if it is in, you know, not aligned with what you normally eat and how you feel, right? Maybe you don't normally eat ice cream, but if you do that, you're going to really that sugar is going to really impact you. So part of it is you need to know what is soothing to you and have that conversation with your partner. I think that with self-soothing, the reason why I'm even talking about that is that I've gotten so many questions, so many emails, so many people reaching to me on social media about needing self-soothing and not knowing how to do it. So I'm always sharing resources and I will give you some of those also in the downloadable guide that you can get at terrycole.com forward slash guide because so many of these are free apps that you can put on your phone. I love the breathing app. That is something that you can do it for five minutes and it will absolutely make a difference in how you feel. It literally puts the brakes on all of that cortisol and all of that fast heart beating that is happening when you can be mindful enough to say, I'm just going to pop on that breathing app and I'm going to watch the ball because you can, it, you can do it with sound or without sound. I most of the time do it without sound and you're just looking at this ball that is inflating and then deflating and you are inhaling as it's inflating and you are exhaling as it's deflating. And what I love about the breathing app is that it doesn't require me to do a lot of thinking or for me to be very present because when I am out of equilibrium, I don't have the capacity in that moment to do a lot of like complicated problem solving. I need something that already exists and so do you. So it's all about being proactive thinking about this ahead of time, having the conversation if you're in a relationship ahead of time so that when these things happen, you have a go-to, right? Your stress relief and self-soothing toolkit will be your go-to. You can also do that virtually. You can do it on your phone, right? I I have one that I do in real life, physical things that create my toolkit. Um, But you can also, if it's easier for you, you can do it virtually. Whatever you will do, is the right thing for you to do. So don't make yourself wrong. Because listen, and when we're feeling this way, when we are anxious, when we cannot get soothed, the last thing we need to do is be self-judgmental, right? We really need to flex the self-compassion muscle. And by setting yourself up for success when you're in that situation, that is flexing your self-compassion muscle. So I would love to know, If this helped you, did you create your self-relief and self-soothing toolkit? Are you using it? What is happening? Um, And what do you find soothing? Actually self-soothing, what do you do? Because I would love to hear your ideas as well. I really hope that this added value to your life. I appreciate your time. And as always, take care of you.